Hi, welcome to the latest in the UC's Bite Size podcast series. I'm joined today by lead physician, lead acute physician Steve Arden from, from Brighton. And we're going to be talking about the initial clinical conversation and decision. Um, so, Steve, quick in, introduction from yourself, and then what, what do you mean by the initial clinical decision and conversation? So, what I mean by the uh, uh, initial um, clinical conversation is basically what would have been the call from generally a GP uh, in the community uh, passing on a referral to a specialty. And I think that's developed over time to become more valuable communication than simply telling us that a patient is coming uh, to hospital. Um, and so in Brighton, particularly with the COVID situation, we've generated that as a more significant role, um, which allows for a good conversation to happen um, with the community partner um, to plan the next stage of care of a patient and to not really uh, name it as a referral, but basically as a discussion because there's no uh, planned outcome for that patient until that conversation is over in terms of we look for the best value that we can offer to the patient over the time scale that is realistic. So, of course, there'd be a simple conversation for somebody who clearly needs to come in today, who's got an active GI bleed, for example, that's a very clear conversation. Um, but that also, even if we know that the patient needs to come right now, um, there's a lot that we can do um, before the patient arrives. Uh, so we can allocate the most appropriate space for, for that patient to be, the most appropriate staff to care for that patient and pre-warn um, the resources in the hospital or the services such as endoscopy or imaging or whatever, that we are going to need capacity for this patient. And a lot of that can be planned before the patient arrives. Um, to take an example of um, a patient has um, a swallowing issue, they can't swallow, they need an endoscopy, uh, they've had this previous history before, we know what's wrong with them, they need to have a dilatation of the esophagus. Um, the patient's able to drink small sips of water currently. So can I call ahead to endoscopy, plan them on the list, the next available list, so that by the time that the patient arrives at hospital, we know exactly where they're going, when he's on the list, rather than starting all that at five o'clock in the evening when the patient arrives, only to need to be admitted overnight. Um, not to have an endoscopy until the next day. So it's just simple things like that, really, that you can plan a lot. Um, and also, we now, GPs come to us asking for our advice rather than a direct referral. Um, we can plan around coming up for same day emergency care when necessary. Um, and Due to the COVID times, obviously, there's lots of um, teleconsults with primary care, and there's, we've got to be a little bit more sensitive to the patient and also to our community colleagues on if a patient's likely to need chest x-ray or imaging, there's no point for a physical examination by the GP. Uh, we can take that off the GP based on the likely outcome and needs of the patient from a teleconsult. So this sounds like a really helpful, useful conversation, just a clinical conversation in advance of what a, a formal, more formal referral might be, which which may lack some of the some of the, uh, the the connection between the two the two professionals, where you're trying to get a little bit more detail, a bit of bit more depth of understanding, which the a normal referral may not give you. And I suppose having that conversation in advance of of the patient even even coming to the hospital, you can just pick out what's what's necessary and ask those those questions and as you say it's more of a conversation isn't it rather than a often a referral may lack some of the more uh, some of the more deeper de detail that you're looking for as you say which which allows you, uh, allows you to set things up well in advance or or prepare for the patient even before they uh, they arrive so so building on that what you know what what else do you think is is important about that that conversation or those 
that initial conversation beyond just the initial you know un- understanding of the needs for the patient a- anything else that goes beyond that yeah definitely because um if you have a only a small group of uh, clinicians providing these um conversations then a level of trust builds up with our community colleagues which allows us to manage patients in a a more appropriate way i think the old style referral quite often um um what's the word i'm looking for is um it kind of undervalues our community partners really because it was a case of there's a patient coming there unwell there might be a bit of background history but that would probably be lost by the time that the patient gets seen in hospital in any real terms and we're starting at that point when they arrive in hospital rather than if we take um if we develop trust within our community partners through these conversations then there's a lot more we can do for patients before they arrive or we can manage patients in a different way we can negotiate what the primary care partners are con- will continue to do whilst we do the bits in hospital that need to be uh, done example would be an anemia pathway um we don't on the whole apart from active bleeding in brighton investigate cause of anemia um the gp continues to do that through their own pathways through outpatients and they'll only refer to us if a patient needs an iron infusion or a blood transfusion that limits the amount of time a patient spends side in hospital make sure that they are only here for the care that they need um, and allows our community partners to continue to, to manage the patient um often um through two week pathways as quick as we would be able to uh, so I think trust, like trust is great. Yeah, I think uh, that's a really key key point to, to remember, isn't it? That that as she, she points out already, this is not just about two two separate organisations or people working in isolation. It's about how you bring those those together. It seems like it's working work, working well. So, have you seen a, you know, so what what's changed in the way that you deliver your service then as a, as as a result of this? You know, to, moving on from what would be a traditional model of just a straight referral. How do you feel this kind of developed the service that you offer? Well, now it it means that patients spend uh, less time on site, um, more go through a same day emergency care process, and we actually run that um, conversation for our community partners out of one site, um, but the trust has two sites, so we take all those calls. Um, at our uh, Haywards Heath site, which is generally a little bit quieter. Um, And we will move as many patients from the more busy tertiary center um, up to the Haywards Heath um, center to see acute medicine. So it allows us to look at the resources available across two sites, not one site. And depending on um, how busy we are at either site, we can move patients to, the site with the more resource for them on the day that they require it so the patients like it yeah I mean, that's, that's 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 the important picking out picking out those picking out the elements of the service which actually makes makes a difference but this seems to be i want to say it's a huge leap from from the traditional model but you know how did you go about setting this up this you know this must have been a point in time where you thought you know somebody had an idea and Thought this would be a brilliant idea. How, how do you go about doing this? I'm sure. That's well, it's not it's it's not uncommon for referrals to be taken by acute medical consultants, and I think that that is that has its own value. There are probably some services that still are taking referrals, um, potentially at non-clinical levels, and some at um, band six or band uh, band six uh, uh, nursing levels. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, uh, those kind of referrals, if they're the obvious ones that definitely need to come today and there's little value in trying to get other things planned. It could be any clinician. It just needs to be someone who's incredibly experienced. So that's nurses and and medics. Um, But 
where we've gone on from that is what we noticed was is that when we're in a busy site and we're actually managing um, patients face to face, having the phone was becoming an incredible burden. You would get interrupted all the time. You would want to keep the GP conversations very short um, because you were managing a, a patient. So we've actually been able to job plan in um, basically a physician holding the phone and that's their primary duty. So they can sit down in front of a computer, look at all the patient's records, think about what would be best for the patient, review the blood results with the GP, generate some holding of risk um, of the patient in the community uh, with some safety netting before the patient arrives. So, you know, a conversation may last five minutes or maybe even a bit longer, but it will mean that the patient is expected and things are planned already before the patient arrives. And that just prevents patients attending hospital, particularly later on in the day, um, and being admitted overnight, where in fact, probably overnight, there's no value added to their care during that, that eight, 10 hours. Um, that, must have been, that must have been quite a, a mental leap for some to, to make that jump to, to build into the, into the job plan, to actually have somebody, rather than just try and pick up that while they're doing the day job. I mean, it depends on the intensity of the role. And so some some hospitals uh, at our quieter site, it would still be possible to see patients, review patients and do this. And, and we do do a bit of that. Um, but certainly on busier tertiary sites and large university teaching hospitals, it's probably not. Um, but you kind of feel like what you are, the value you're adding is a little bit like air traffic control in a way. You know, you're holding patients, um, planning their arrival. And sometimes we simply say to the GP, we can't get enough information like this. Why don't you, um, I'll call the patient directly and we can actually have um, a virtual clinic style um, conversation with the patient to understand exactly what's going on um, and, and, and plan whether they need to attend today or whether we can um, come up with some other plans. So, you know, all things are possible. And uh, especially during COVID when, yeah, during COVID, we've had so many virtual clinics and we're getting very comfortable with talking to patients over the phone and making and optimizing that. So, um, you know, there's plenty of options out there, but you just do need the time to do it. And obviously you need the access and the opportunities in the house to have conversations with your uh, specialty clinical colleagues um, to make a difference. So obviously if it doesn't matter whether I tell a uh, endoscopy now um, that I need an endoscopy this afternoon, if there's never any capacity this afternoon, then that's a kind of pointless uh, thing. So you're kind of, it makes people aware that a lot of the, what was unscheduled work can be planned in a way um, because many of these patients, it takes them four hours to get to hospital with, particularly if they need an ambulance. So there's all that four hours that we could be using to plan and understand uh, what our patients need. And, you know, with our community partners and the trust there, we shouldn't be saying, well, we don't really know what the patient needs until they come here and we've assessed them. Many of them have been assessed by their GP who was probably a member of the medical training, uh, medical on-call team three, four years ago. So, you know, it's, you know, we, it's developing those relationships, which I think is absolutely key in uh, making all this work. I think, you, I think you're right there, Steve, on, on, on that particular point. It's, we, we do at times some drift into our, you know, our, our, our tribes and become, become a little bit tribal around our, our, our views and we and you know lose that communication that simple communication as you say you with with other healthcare professionals and other parts of the system um you know and, and that trust element is 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 huge you know when that when that breaks down we start looking at you know blame or we start looking at at other other issues it's not us it's them or it's not you know it's not yeah. it's not our fault it's somebody else's fault and i think these 
these conversations just allowing very natural, healthy conversation to take place exactly. as a whole system rather than in individual entities. Yeah, and you need the time to do that because when you're busy, going back many years ago when the medical SHO took the referrals and I was one of those medical SHOs back in the dark ages, it was almost like you were playing Dirty Harry in terms of you were trying to... Um, it was it was it was it reminded me of the Dirty Harry bit. It says, "Are you feeling lucky today, Tons?" In terms of to the GP, they had to try and get that referral past you and into the system. But nowadays, you know, when people pick up the phone, I'm like, "Oh, hi, I'm the acute medical consultant. How can I help you?" Because the whole point is, it's we're all in it together. Um, the patient needs to. A journey and it's not about reducing the amount of work that your system requires to do today if there's patients out there that require your system so you have to just all work together and identify what is the work that i definitely need to do today what can i plan for tomorrow how can i smooth out the peaks and the troughs of of my workload so that i've always got uh, the resources available to manage the patients as quickly as possible without them queuing in corridors, lying on trolleys that they don't need to be on trolleys, and making the most of uh, same-day emergency care. Well, I think that's great advice to, to, to wrap up on. I think those, those last few top tips there, I think, are, are really valuable that we can, we can take away from that. So, Steve, thanks for your time. It's been, been really interesting. This is a really fascinating model. I love the, the, whole, the whole dynamics of this kind of approach where we're starting to blend our, our approaches and not see ourselves as working in isolation. I think that really does benefit the patient. And just breaking a few perceived rules around what should happen and what shouldn't happen. You know, that mm -hmm. conversation around let's have a chat with the patient and see what see what their thoughts are. You know, that's sometimes taken out of the patient's hands and given to given to other people. So mm -hmm. brilliant stuff. Thanks for that, Steve. We'll uh, we'll wrap up now, but. Uh, Plenty more podcasts on our podcast channel, on our on our YouTube channel, so go see. Um, plenty there to go and go and learn from. And we'll be back for our, our next episode uh, in a week or so time. See you soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you.